Thank you, sir. And let me say thank you to each of the witnesses. Thank you for your service. Uh, each of you works in an incredibly difficult and important job, and, and, and we are grateful uh, for the hard work you put in. Um, Mr. Chester, let's, let's talk about fentanyl for a minute. Uh, fentanyl is killing Americans each and every day. Can you tell this committee where it comes from and how it makes its way into the United States? Yes, Senator, uh, and you're absolutely correct. What, what we have seen uh, really over the last two plus years uh, in the United States is the rise in the prevalence and the lethality of fentanyl in U.S. communities to the point that it has outpaced heroin and all other drugs in terms of mortality in the U.S. The fentanyl scene in the United States primarily is manufactured in China. And uh, it is not only the, the, the base fentanyl uh, molecule itself, but there are, we have, uh, CBP has encountered up to 33 different analogs of the fentanyl molecule also produced in China and shipped into the United States. There's really two primary routes. The first one is individuals who get on the internet uh, usually on the dark web, using cryptocurrency, purchase it for themselves, for their own use, or for distribution to a small number of known users. And that generally comes in the country through the U.S. mail system or through express consignment carriers uh, who are commercial carriers. The second way what is... What quantity are we typically talk, talking about there? Very, very small quantities, Senator. And so uh, you, you're really talking 600, 700, 800 grams. And because of that, and because of its potency and its lethality, it's purchased at a very low dollar amount. So not only is it in a small package that's hard to detect, it's at a dollar figure that doesn't raise a lot of suspicion. So that's, that's the one primary vector into the United States. The second one is up through Mexico, where Finnish fentanyl is, is, is purchased uh, in China, uh, sent to Mexico, and then either shipped as part of a poly drug load across the southwest border, uh, mixed in and milled with heroin or uh, inert matter like lactose, south of the border and then brought uh, up and sold as synthetic heroin. Or the third way, what we're increasingly seeing is it's pressed into pills and sold as fake prescription opioids and brought in large numbers of pills uh, across the southwest border. Um, so there are several different vectors for it to get in the United States. Uh, we can very clearly see it, the public uh, health effects uh, that it has in the United States. And fentanyl, will, fentanyl and its analogs will continue to be a substantial problem uh, in our drug environment in America. How many deaths are we looking at on an annual basis from fentanyl? So uh, the most recent data that we have for, um, in 2017 was 28,400 deaths or about nine per day. And that is what's, what's termed by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention is synthetic opioids other than methadone which is a category that's dominated by fentanyl and, and its analogs. And that is a 47% increase from the previous year. And what's the role of the Mexican drug cartels in bringing fentanyl into this country? Uh, prin principally, uh, their role is to purchase it from Mexico, and, or I'm sorry, from China, uh, and then to process it there in Mexico and then bring it into the United States for distribution through their own cartel distribution change and then, and, and then obviously to a face-to-face -face, uh, sale in the United States. One of the things that makes fentanyl so attractive for uh, drug cartels is the low upfront price um, and obviously the high profits on the, on the far end. And that's whether it is mixed into uh, heroin and purchased by an intravenous drug user, by a known drug user, or whether it is sold as a fake pill, sometimes to an unwitting individual who believes they're getting Oxycontin or per Percocet, and they're actually getting fentanyl and a fentanyl analog pressed into pill form. And do we have an assessment of how much money the cartels are making from this trafficking? It, trafficking as a whole? Well, let's take fentanyl or, or overall, both. Um, uh, overall, and I believe it was Senator Cornyn, Cornyn who, uh, who quoted uh, the price of about $64 billion today, and that's that's... A absolutely within the realm of the possible, $64 billion. Um, uh, the uh, drugs continue to be the most lucrative and reliable source of income for transnational criminal organizations in Mexico. Chief Provost, thank you for your good work. I've gotten to know a great many of the men and women in your agency, and I'm grateful for their, their bravery and courage and their service. Uh, thank you. Let me ask you from your perspective, what additional tools are needed 
to slow down or stop uh, this, this flow of fentanyl and, and, and other illegal drugs into the country? Well, thank you, Senator. Um, there are numerous things that we need. As you know, the border is very dynamic, and there is no one thing that it just seems to uh, be that, that uh, main issue that would stop it. We need, between the ports of entry in particular, um, obviously more technology, more detection technology. Um, we need more men and women. Uh, I need more canine handlers as well. We utilize them quite a bit. And, of course, I do need more barrier because that does impede and deny, and it does prevent uh, the entries. At the ports of entry, uh, there was discussion earlier, and my colleagues over there are expanding their non-intrusive uh, technology, which we also utilize at our checkpoints, and that certainly assists us as well. But it is a no one-size-fits-all. It's a mixture of all of those things. Now, one of the, the tools you mentioned that, 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 that you needed was more physical barriers, be it a wall or other forms of physical barriers. Uh, as you know, we're in the midst of vigorous debates right now uh, in, in the Senate. Let me ask you, in your professional experience, uh, what is the impact of a wall or physical barrier and, 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 and what, what are the benefits of it? Personally, and, and just to keep it on topic with cartels, when I was an agent in Douglas, Arizona, um, East of Douglas one night there was a drive through as we call them, and we used to have numerous drive throughs in the area. I was involved in the seizure of um, over 490 pounds of cocaine. Thankfully, the drive shaft on the truck broke as the vehicle was trying to get back south away from us. We had no barrier at that time along the border in that area. Once we put barrier in in that area, those drive throughs stopped. That is just one example when it comes to particularly narcotic smuggling. But as you know, Senator, the, the barriers are needed for impedance and denial. Technology provides a completely different capability for us. It provides situational awareness, and we certainly need that as well. But if we can't impede and deny, when we're talking about a 2,000-mile border and uh, a very difficult terrain to work in, then the situational awareness lets me know something's crossing, but it sure doesn't stop it from crossing. So in terms of technology, what have you all found is, is most effective, being it a virtual barrier, being infrared, fixed wing, rotary wing aircraft? What, what, what has the greatest positive impact enabling you to, to, to most effectively do your job? Because of the diversity of the border, we find a mixture of all of those things, and it truly depends upon the area. Uh, when we are talking about uh, areas with quick vanishing times, obviously having a camera technology so that we can see. When we work in the remote areas, more detection capability is necessary for us. Uh, we have been expanding our tools in our toolkit and uh, have found that having a diverse toolkit is critical for us to be able to deploy the appropriate resources in the appropriate location. Uh, Ms. Ayala, um, can you describe the extent of the violence perpetrated uh, by Mexican drug cartels, both in the United States and, and in Mexico. Well, I would say that uh, Mexican cartels and cartels in general have um, become more and more violent. Uh, they follow a pattern of uh, violence, and then when certain um, federal officials are sent to certain areas, then the areas calm down and they're discouraged from violence in order for them to pursue their um, trafficking activities throughout the, um, the border area, south of the border. On um, this side of the border, I, I think we saw a lot of violence as far as um, in 2005 in the South Texas border, and then later on, on um, with some murders, and then later on what we saw was mostly the um, purchase of weapons to smuggle to um, the Mexico in order to uh, engage in extortion and um, other assaultive and, and, and um, violent actions and torture on the um, Mexican side. What we see also now is that the cartels are using um, MS-13 and other gang members um, for kidnapping and extortion and um, other violent crimes um, in, um, that fall under the RICO statutes. And, and to that's what extent why is that crossing north of the border into the United States? Excuse me? To what extent is that crossing north of the border into the United States? Well, as far as um, when we're talking about the gang piece, uh, to put in perspective, we have about 100,000 MS-13 MS gang members in the um, Northern Triangle. 
and uh, more than half of them are in El Salvador, 15,000 are in jails, 30,000 in the street. We have approximately 10,000 gang members here, um, MS-13 gang members here in the United States. And through our Operation Community Shield, um, the last five or six years, we've uh, picked up over 8,500 MS-13 members, associates, and seized uh, multi-ton quantities of you know, drugs and um, weapons and um, other um, violent implements, whether it be ammunition and so forth. Thank you.